Hello everyone! We're back with a new video for the lecture course in Organic Chemistry dedicated to undergraduate students. Today we will continue to discuss chemical bonds. To begin, let's review what we have discussed in the previous lectures. We have learned about the types of atomic radii, the concept of bond length, examined loose structures and the polarity of a chemical compound. In this video, we will dive deeper into the topic of chemical bonds. Our plan for today is as follows. To begin, we will explore the Schrodinger equation in greater depth in order to understand its physical meaning. Then, utilizing our knowledge of Lewis structures and the Schrodinger equation, we will take a closer look at chemical bonding from a different perspective, specifically the valence bond theory. This video is a short recap of the valence bond theory foundations that are essential to understand for our next video about the resonance theory. Let's go! As we have learned in previous lectures, we need to use quantum mechanics in order to understand the behavior of microparticles such as electrons. We have already mentioned the Schrodinger equation and its central role in quantum mechanics. You can see it on the slide right now. If you don't fully understand what is being discussed here, check out our previous video first. Today we will discuss the physical meaning of a wave function, which is the solution of the Schrodinger equation in more detail. To recap, the solution of the Schrodinger equation can be expressed in the form of a wave function psi, which is related to the energy and position of an electron in the three-dimensional space. In reality, however, it turns out that wave functions do not have any physical meaning. In other words, the wave function that describes the motion of electrons cannot be measured experimentally and is thus not observable. It simply serves as a mathematical concept that is useful for chemists and physicists. You will learn the reason why Psi doesn't have any physical meaning during your theoretical chemistry course, but just keep it in mind for now. In contrast, the square of the wave function does have physical meaning and it can be measured experimentally. Actually, the square of the wave function is a probability density to find an electron at a specific point. Erwin Schrödinger initially proposed his interpretation of the wave function. He suggested that the electron was smeared in space and this charge is distributed over different points. In this case, the square of the wave function represents the charge density at each point in space. It's a very logical conclusion, isn't it? After all, it is easy to imagine as a wave distributed in space on the surface of the water. Keeping that in mind, can we say that an electron is just a negative charge distributed in space? Unfortunately, this interpretation turned out to be fundamentally wrong. Amazing! Schrodinger derived an equation but could not correctly substantiate its meaning. This is because an electron is not a wave in its pure sense. In reality, it has been experimentally proven that electrons also exhibit particle properties, therefore it is both a wave and a particle at the same time. Eventually, Max Born derived the generally accepted interpretation of the wave function. He considered the electron not only a wave, but also took into account its particle properties. Thus, Max Born stated that the Psi function squared only gives us the probability of detecting an electron at a given point in space. Ok, so we understand that an electron has a certain set of probabilities to be located at different points in the space around the nucleus. And the space where an electron is most likely to be found is called an atomic orbital. This is a very important concept for every chemist to understand. Here you can see an animation of the electron density distribution. The red area signifies a high probability to find an electron, while the blue area represents a low probability of electron detection. As you can see, the probability to find an electron is very high near the nucleus, and the farther we move away from it, the lower the probability of finding an electron. But these animations don't tell the whole story, so we will look at some other ways to depict orbitals. One of the most efficient ways to represent the area in which the probability to find an electron is high is the orbital. Of course, the shapes of an atomic orbital are determined by wave functions. Here, you can see various atomic orbitals such as s, p and d orbitals in 3D. I hope you remember the forms of these orbitals from your inorganic chemistry course, that is why we won't discuss them in greater detail today. The same is true for the quantum numbers that are used to define these orbitals. To further simplify the orbital representation, we can draw a line in 2D instead of 3D, which will also serve to represent the space where an electron spends approximately 95% of its time. This will give us something similar to the figure on the slide. 
This is one of the most widely accepted and simplest definitions of an atomic orbital. An atomic orbital is a region in the space around the nucleus in which the probability of the existence of an electron is roughly 95%. I hope everything is clear for you. If you have any doubts, feel free to rewind the video as we will be moving on to the next section. Now let's look at the chemical bond theory from a bit more complex perspective than before. In the previous lectures we talked about chemical bonds and described them using the Lewis structures. Here are some examples of them. Of course chemical bonds can be adequately described using Lewis structures. However, this simple representation isn't sufficient sometimes. Furthermore, Lewis structures can only describe a chemical bond qualitatively and intuitively, but they don't allow us to perform any real calculations to explain chemical bonds in a quantitative sense. To address this issue, Walter Heitler and Fritz London proposed another way of describing the bond, based on the quantum mechanical calculations of the hydrogen molecule H2. Eventually, their calculations became the basis for the creation of another theory, called the valence bond theory. However, there exists another theory, which we will discuss in the next lectures. This theory further describes the concept of bonds between atoms and molecules. It is referred to as the molecular orbital theory. It was developed by chemists Friedrich Hund and Robert Mulliken. Today this theory is considered to be the most widely accepted one in quantum chemistry. So let's begin. The valence bond theory or VB theory is used to understand the interactions between separate atoms as they come together to form molecules. Valence bond theory assumes that all bonds are localized bonds formed between two atoms by the donation of an electron from each atom. This is actually an invalid assumption, because many atoms bond using the localized electrons. Valence bond theory describes covalent bond formation, as well as the electronic structure of molecules. The theory assumes that electrons occupy atomic orbitals of individual atoms within a molecule, and that the electrons of one atom are attracted to the nucleus of another atom. This attraction increases as the atoms approach one another, until the atoms reach a minimum distance, where the electron density begins to cause repulsion between the two atoms. This electron density at the minimum distance between the two atoms is where the lowest potential energy is acquired, and it can be considered to be what holds the two atoms together in a chemical bond. Suppose we have two isolated hydrogen atoms. Their nuclei are labeled HA and HB, and the corresponding electrons are denoted 1 and 2 respectively. When the atoms are so far apart, there is no interaction between them. Electron 1 is exclusively associated with the hydrogen atom HA, while electron 2 resides with the nucleus of the hydrogen atom HB. As we have discussed, the wave function is such a function that describes the motion of electrons and thus describes the behavior and properties of a molecule completely. That's why any possible state in which one or more atoms exist can be described by its wave function. Thus the aforementioned state can be described by a wave function of Psi1. We don't need to know the exact mathematical form of the wave function Psi1 yet. Instead, we need to understand which state it describes. Here the electron 1 is associated with the nucleus HA, and the electron 2 is attributed to the nucleus HB. The notation HA1 stands for nucleus HA with electron 1, and so on. When hydrogen atoms are close together, we cannot tell which electron is associated with which nucleus. Although we gave them labels, the two nuclei are indistinguishable. In this case, the two electrons can't be distinguished either. It is consistent with the Lewis structure in which the shared electron pair was attributed to both atoms simultaneously. To put it simply, electron 1 could be associated with the hydrogen atom HA and electron 2 with the atom HB and vice versa. Both combinations are equally probable. This can be depicted by the wave functions Psi 1 and Psi 2. Ultimately, we can describe the covalent bond between the hydrogen atoms by a linear combination of wave functions Psi 1 and Psi 2. Don't be afraid of this mathematical term. The linear combination is just the sum of functions that are multiplied by some factors denoted as c with corresponding index. So we get the wave function that describes the covalent bond and we call it psi covalent or psi plus. Here the capital N represents what we call a normalization factor. You might wonder, why do we need it? The answer is quite simple. Any wave function possesses several mathematical properties that make the lives of quantum chemists easier. 
One of these properties is that the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity of the square of the wave function should be equal to 1. Here the Greek letter tau is the coordinate on which the wave function psi depends. In general, it is quite easy to calculate the normalization factor using the equation shown on the slide. I hope that everything is clear for you now, and if not, you know where the comments are. And of course, don't forget about the webinars that we will organize based on the questions left in the specific thread on the forum. Let's continue. Ok, let's get back to the hydrogen molecule. Another linear combination of Psi 1 and Psi 2 can be expressed in the equation shown on the slide. It is clear that the new wave function denoted with Psi minus differs from the Psi covalent or Psi plus by the sign between Psi 1 and Psi 2. As I have mentioned before, the linear combination of wave functions is just the sum of the wave functions that are multiplied by factors. But here we can see that the wave function Psi minus is the difference. How is it possible? Well, the answer is also very simple. The wave function Psi 2 is multiplied by factor minus 1, so we can rewrite our wave function Psi minus as the sum of Psi 1 and negative Psi 2, as you can see on the screen. Let's examine the spins of both electrons in Psi plus and Psi minus. In the case of Psi plus, electrons 1 and 2 have different spins, namely plus 1 half and minus 1 half. In contrast, the spins in Psi minus are parallel. Let's say both of them are plus 1 half. From inorganic chemistry, we know that the opposite spins stabilize the system upon a pairing, while parallel spins tend to repel each other. In other words, the closer the parallel spins are, the higher is the energy of the system. This means that the Psi plus wave function represents the stabilizing interaction, while the Psi minus is associated with the destabilizing interaction. Until now, we have only considered situations where both hydrogen atoms A and B have one electron, either electron 1 or electron 2. However, we can imagine some extensions of this model. For example, it is not necessarily true that atom A has electrons at all. The same could be true for hydrogen atom B as well. Thus, we can propose two more structures of the hydrogen molecule, in which two electrons are attributed to the same atom, while another atom doesn't have any electrons at all. Both possible states are depicted at the bottom of the slide. If hydrogen atom A has two electrons, then it's negatively charged and forms an anion, while hydrogen atom B has no electrons and forms a cation. Pause the video and inspect the slide carefully. Take your time and make notes. Of course both atoms A and B are in reality indistinguishable, that is why we can make atom B an anion and atom A a cation, just as shown on the slide here. Both highlighted structures are equally probable, and they represent an ionic interaction. The first situation can be described by the wave function Psi 3, and the second one by the wave function Psi 4. Up until now we have formulated the four wave functions that can describe the bonding in a hydrogen molecule. The wave function Psi 1 and Psi 2 describe covalent bonding, while functions Psi 3 and Psi 4 describe ionic bonding. As usual, we will first multiply each wave function by a factor denoted as c, and then we will make a linear combination from the resulting terms, as you can see on the screen now. The factors c1, c2, c3 and c4 reflect the physical significance of each term in the linear combination. Scientists call these factors weights. The higher the weight of the individual term, the higher is the contribution to the overall wave function. If we note that the wave functions Psi 1, 2, 3 and 4 represent the unique distribution of electrons between atoms A and B, then it will be clear that the higher weights correspond to a higher probability of the existence of each configuration. Note that the configurations described by Psi 1 and Psi 2 are equally probable as atoms A and B cannot be distinguished in reality. That's why C1 is equal to C2. The same is true for terms Psi 3 and Psi 4. So C3 is equal to C4. Now we can factorize our expression and obtain the new formulation of the wave function for a hydrogen molecule. We can further simplify this expression by denoting the sum of Psi 1 and Psi 2 as Psi covalent, and Psi 3 plus Psi 4 as Psi ionic. Based on this model of H2 calculations with C3 equals 0.25, gives us a value of 75 pm for HH bond length and 398 kJ per mole for the bond dissociation energy. Note that C3 is equal to 0.25, meaning that the ionic terms contribute less to the overall wave function of the hydrogen molecule compared to covalent interactions.
This result is consistent with our previous knowledge that the HH bond is covalent. However, neglecting the ionic contribution can lead to significantly lower accuracy. Let's take a look at the structures that are described by wave functions psi covalent and psi ionic. They are depicted on the slide right now. Dihydrogen is described as a resonance hybrid of these contributing resonance or canonical structures. Each of the structures on the slide represents a resonance structure and the double-headed arrows indicate the resonance between them. The contributions made by both ionic resonance structures are equal and significantly less compared to a covalent one. The term resonance hybrid is somewhat unclear but is too established to be changed. A crucial piece of information in regards to resonance structures is that they do not exist as separate species. Rather, they indicate extreme bonding pictures, the combination of which gives us a description of the molecule overall. So let's take a look at some other diatomic molecules in which the chemical bonds are predicted by the valence bond theory. First, consider the information of a chlorine molecule Cl2. On the slide you can see the ground state electronic configuration of a chlorine atom. It is apparent that chlorine has one unpaired electron in its ground state. This leads to the formation of a single bond between two chlorine atoms. Of course, the covalent bond between chlorine atoms is also predicted by the octet rule we discussed previously and is well represented by a Lewis structure. This configuration can be described by the wave function Psi1 and Psi2 that combine to form the Psi covalent. As in the hydrogen molecule model, we can formulate the ionic configuration for the Cl2 molecule, and the corresponding wave functions are Psi3 and Psi4. Don't forget the resonance arrow between the resulting resonance structures. Of course we assume from our previous knowledge that the covalent configuration will predominate compared to the ionic configurations. This is reflected by the relation of the coefficients that are highlighted on the screen now. That's it for today. This was a brief recap of the foundations of the valence bond theory. The reason for introducing this information to you is that it's quite important to understand the origin and physical meaning of resonance structures. These structures are widely used in organic chemistry to explain the stability of various molecular species and to understand the mechanisms of organic reactions. We've learned a lot today, haven't we? Let's sum up today's video. We started with the physical meaning of a wave function in chemistry, and then we recapped the foundations of the valence bond theory and described several molecules with VB theory. In the next video, we'll learn more about resonance structures and resonance theory, which is vital for every organic chemist and is based on the VB theory discussed today. If you have any questions related to this video, or any other topic in chemistry, biochemistry, or pharmaceutical sciences, you are more than welcome to ask them on our website, forum, or in the comment section below this video. If you found this video helpful, give us a like and subscribe to our channel. Thank you very much for your attention, and we will see each other once again in the next video.